A reading from Job, and we begin. And Job answered the Holy One, and he said, I know you can do anything, and no devising is beyond you. Who is this obscuring counsel without knowledge? Therefore I told but did not understand wonders beyond me that I did not know. Hear, pray, and I will speak. Let me ask you that you may inform me. By the ear's rumor I heard of you, and now my eye has seen you. Therefore, I do recant, and I change my mind about dust and ashes. And it happened after the Holy One had spoken these words to Job, that the Holy One said to Eliphaz the Temanite, my wrath has, flare, has flared against you and your two companions, because you have not spoken rightly of me, as did my servant Job. For the wisdom contained in these holy words, we give thanks. Amen. Have compassion for everyone you meet, even if they don't want it. What seems bad manners, conceit bad manners or cynicism is always a sign of things no ears have heard, no eyes have seen. You don't know what wars are going on down where the spirit meets the bone. Ring the bells that still can ring. Forget your perfect offering. There is a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. We've made it. We finally made it to the end of the story of Job. I am so grateful that you all hung in there with me. Let's remind ourselves where we've been. Once upon a time, there was a man named Job. He was blameless and upright and feared God, and he shunned evil. God said there was none like Job on earth. Job was a good person, a very good person. The adversary the prosecuting attorney for God, suggested to God that perhaps Job was so good because God gave everything uh, to Job and protected Job. If that protection was lifted, well, Job might not come out looking so very good. God said, go ahead, go after Job, take all his stuff away from him, just don't hurt his person. The adversary did. Job lost everything, including his children. It got worse for Job. After another conversation between God and the adversary, Job's whole body was covered with sores, another test of Job's, Job's faithfulness to God. Job remained silent for seven days and then began to curse and lament his life. Are we all still on board here? Okay. His friends came by to support him. Their support included telling Job he must have done something terrible, even made up some things Job must have done. Job should just admit it, and God would forgive him. Those were Job's friends. Job was convinced he had done nothing wrong and said so. Finally, God showed up in a whirlwind and spoke to Job. God described a world that was awesome and unruly. Creation is creation, God said, bounded but free to move around within those boundaries. God is creator, not controller. Humanity suffers, not because God is punishing them for wrongdoing, but simply because creation is awesome and unruly. God's review of creation invited Job to consider that bad things happened to good people and were not necessarily a reflection of their evil deeds or sinful ways that deserved punishment from God. This was clearly a move away from the theological doctrine of God's retribution for wrongdoing. This is a huge move for us as Christians, let me just tell you. An understanding established, this retribution uh, doctrine, an understanding established with the second story of creation when the Humans in paradise disobeyed God and were evicted from the garden as punishment. This, of course, was the understanding held uh, fast by Job, Job's friends. God reminded Job that Job was created in the image of God. Humanity, Job, 
was made a little lower than God, given dominion over the works of God's hands, with all things put under their feet. God was inviting Job to participate, to prepare himself, gird up his loins, to be a co-creator with God in God's awesome and unruly creation. Job and all humanity were given a place to participate in this endeavor, given an opportunity to stand up to God, question God, have conversation with God in their capacity as co-creators. After all that, and that's like 41 ver uh, chapters. <laughs> after all that, after God's poetic, poetic address, God, Job spoke out one last time. And what did he say? Well, first, he declared that God could do anything. Then he admitted that he, Job, hadn't really known what was going on, didn't understand. But now, now Job was beginning to get the picture. After God's apparent absence, not responding when Job cried out, now Job could hear God and could see God. God had, in fact, shown up finally and explained God's self. God's words cleared some things up for Job. And then we get down to what many scholars say are the most important words in this story of 42 chapters holding over 1,000 verses. Just a handful of words point to the heart of the story. Job said, Therefore do I recant, and I change my mind about dust and ashes. The NRSV translation of this verse goes like this. Therefore I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. This translation, we're going to get rid of this, just hold on. <laughs> this translation would suggest that Job did not buy into God's argument that Job uh, was created in God's image, created a little lower than God, to partner with God in, in the endeavor of creation. This is the NRSV that we all read, right? It would suggest the opposite, in fact. It would suggest that, jo uh, that Job agreed not with God, but with Job's friends. This translation would suggest that Job was nothing was lowly and worthy of nothing, despised and rejected. The translation we have been using throughout this whole telling of Job's story was done by Robert Alter, a renowned Hebrew scholar. He, along with others, suggests the NRSV translation is questionable and that the words in the sixth verse of the 42nd chapter of Job should read as follows. Therefore, do I recant, and I change my mind about dust and ashes. The most important words in this 42-chapter story. It is this translation we will dig into. Job changed the way he thought. He recanted. That's what the word recant means. I had to look it up just to make sure I was right. Uh, to let loose, he let loose his opinions and beliefs and changed his mind about what? Dust and ashes. <laughs> dust and ashes. Job changed his mind about dust and ashes. What does that mean? Well, there are only three times this phrase is seen in the sacred lines of Hebrew scripture. Once in the book of Genesis and twice in the story of Job one of them being in the 30th chapter, and one here in the 42nd chapter. In the 30th chapter of Job, Job was in the midst of lamenting his situation, and here's what Job said. And now my soul is poured out within me. Days of affliction have taken hold of me. The night racks my bones, and the pain that gnaws me takes no rest. With violence, God seizes my garment. God grasps grasps me by the collar of my tunic. God has cast me into the mire, and I have become like dust and ashes. Job was nothing, he thought, merely the stuff that is ground into the earth, shoved around by God and thrown down, discarded. In Genesis... <laughs> Perhaps the most enlightening bit of uh, scripture as we think about the meaning of these words, 
We hear Abraham in conversation with God. Now, I'm just going to remind you, Abraham, you know, God promised Abraham a whole lot of stuff, right? But I want you also to know, if you read the story of Abraham, he messes up so many times. I just want you to keep that in your mind as I continue on with this scripture. Okay, he's in conversation with God. God was trying to decide what to do about Sodom and Gomorrah. We know about Sodom and Gomorrah. There had been a great outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah, and God went down to see if the outcry against this very grave sin was accurate. Abraham stood before God. Then Abraham said, Will you indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there are 50 righteous within the city. Will you then sweep away the place and not forgive it for the 50 righteous who are in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to slay the righteous with the wicked, so that the righteous fare as the wicked. For far be that from you, shall not the judge of all the earth do what is just? And the Holy One said, if I find at Sodom 50 righteous in the city, I will forgive the whole place for their sake. Abraham answered, let me take it upon myself to speak to the Holy One. I, who am but dust and ashes, suppose five of the 50 righteous are lacking. Will you destroy the whole city for lack of five? And God said, I will not destroy it if I find 45 there. And Abra again, Abraham spoke to God. Suppose 40 are found there. God answered, for the sake of 40, I will not do it. Then Abraham said, oh, do not let the Holy One be angry if I speak. Suppose 30 are found there. God answered, I will not do it if I find 30. Abraham said, let me take it upon myself to speak to the Holy One. Suppose 20, 20 righteous people are found there. God answered, for the sake of 20, I will not destroy it. Then Abraham said, oh, do not let the Holy One be angry. If I speak just once more, suppose 10 are found there. God answered, for the sake of 10, I will not destroy it. And the Holy One went away. When the Holy One had finished speaking to Abraham, and Abraham returned to his place. Now, if you want to know what happens to Sodom and Gomorrah, I guess you should read on. I'm not going to go there this morning. The point is, Abraham stood before God. This person who declared he was but dust and ashes stood before God and stood up to God, argued with God about saving the lives of people who were innocent and, and this lowly human being created in God's image out of the dust of the earth, this lowly human being changed God's mind. Abraham wasn't so lowly at all. He held the power to change God's mind. Can you Think about that for just a second. Had the courage to stand up to God, disagree with God about God's intentions, and challenge God to act justly, and in doing so, changed God's mind. Dust and ashes, lowly human beings. Job, who in the 30th chapter had an opinion about himself and what it meant to be dust and ashes, what it meant to be in relationship with God, lowly and worthy of little, cast into the mire, not listened to by God, Job changed his mind. Changed his mind about dust and ashes, the place of humanity in the world. Changed his mind about cowing down before God, changed his mind about his place before God, changed his mind about his relationship with God. We heard God, well, you heard me talk about what God said. I, I don't guess anybody read all of those verses and chapters that we went through last week. We heard God in the verses before these invite Job to do just that, to change his mind about his role in the world. God invited Job to stand up, to speak up 
invited Job to gird up his loins, prepare himself to get to work with God in the endeavor called creation. God wanted Job to be in conversation with God, to persuade and challenge God. And finally, Job heard and saw what God was about, and Job changed his mind about dust and ashes. That's the story. Except, there's some final verses in the story we need to talk about. I'm going to talk about those really briefly before I finish up. Here's how it goes. God told the friends that they were wrong about Job. Then, like a little bit of magic, Job's life situation was restored. Job got everything back and more. Twice as much, we are told. The end. <laughs> how tidy. <laughs> now, I'm just going to say, these final verses were most likely added on to the text later on to make a happy ending, because we're all much happier now, aren't we? Because Job got everything restored. We know life does not always contain a happy ending. We know that suffering occurs for no apparent reason to good people. I'll remind us again of Jesus' words in the Gospel of Matthew. For God makes God's sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. We do not always get a happy ending. Just ask the people in the Ukraine or in Gaza. Have a conversation with people across this country living in situations of poverty, city behind bars, or diagnosed with an incurable disease. We don't always get a happy ending. Here's what we do get. We get the invitation to speak up, to question God's sense of justice. Imagine that. We get to question God's sense of justice, to cry out at the wrongdoing being done across the earth, in our country and down the street. Perhaps what we can take away from this story is that we too, merely dust and ashes can stand up and do something. After all, we are created in the image of God, just a little bit lower than God, crowned with glory and honor, given the responsibility to care for all of creation. Perhaps we can cry out when we see wrongdoing, even when those around us dismiss our message and cling to their complacent ways that have deleterious effects on human beings and the globe we live on. Perhaps we can generate more just circumstances for humanity and all creation as we join God's work in the world. If not us, <laughs> then who will it be? If we don't try, who will? God's invitation stands, not just for Job, but for us too. Dust and ashes, we humans are invited into the endeavor of creation with God, alongside God, invited into par partnership with God, invited to stand before God and speak up, and then go do something. Well, how shall we respond? <laughs>